In this presentation we're going to look at some of the basics of cryptography and it follows on from part one. So in this uh, part of it we'll have a look at some public key encryption. Uh, we'll look at some key exchange uh, and then we'll look at uh, also hashing functions and a little bit of adding salt to our cryptography. Okay, so let's introduce Bob again. So there we have Bob. And then let's have Alice. Okay, so here we have, there's Alice. So the basic methods that we have to be able to uh, send information from Bob to Alice is that we can have symmetric encryption. With symmetric encryption, we use one key and we pass that key from Bob to Alice and then Alice is able to decrypt any of the ciphertext. As we'll see in this presentation, uh, we use a method called key exchange to be able to send the key over. And then the second method that we have, and we're going to cover this in this presentation, is asymmetric encryption, where we use two keys, one key to encrypt and then another key to be able to decrypt. The third type that we have is what's called a one-way hash, with this, we take a message or data and then we put it through an algorithm and then we end up with a special hash code which we can't really reverse with any algorithms. And then the final method is to use encoding. With encoding, it's fairly standard that we know how to encode into something and then how to decode from there. So base64 and hexadecimal are two different encoding standards that we might use. Okay, so let's have a look now at whether we use a block or a stream. Okay, so let's uh, draw our block code. So the block code, what we have is that we take our data and then we split it up into blocks. So a typical block size is either 64 bits or 122, 128 bits. So we take each block at a time and then we apply our key and we would apply our key to each of the message blocks one at a time after we've chopped up we'd put some padding in the end to make sure they all fitted into 128 bits and then at the end we we apply the key into each each of the message blocks to create a cipher block and then join them all together and that becomes our transmitted cipher blocks so typical algorithms that we have here are AES, 3DES, RC2 and Blowfish. The stream cipher is different and that stream cipher takes one bit at a time and then encrypts it. So with the stream cipher what we have is that we have uh, an infinite key in this case, some sort of random seed to be able to start the key off and then that will create an infinitely long uh, key. Then we take a plain text, we use exclusive or we take one bit at a time and that becomes the output. So we can see here that we have a 1 and a 0 uh, for the first bit there and then that gives us an output of 1. We'll see exclusive or in a little minute. Stream ciphers are often used when we don't really have a great deal of processing power that we would have uh, to be able to buffer the messages. So the early standards of wireless used a stream cipher because they had limited hardware. And RC4 is an example here. Okay, so here is our RC4 type method. We have what's called an initialization vector that gives us our seed really, and we have our key which is used for the encryption. RC4 then creates the infinitely uh, large key then we take our data stream, exclusive or them together, and we end up with our cipher stream. Exclusive or is used fairly extensively in, in cryptography. And if we draw exclusive or, a basic truth table for it, here we are. So uh, we have an A and a B and a Z. So 0, 0 gives us 0. 0, 1 gives us 1. A 1 and a 0 gives us 1. And a 1 and a 1 gives us 0. So it's a bit like uh, an adding circuit in binary 
and it's used extensively and the reason for it is that we don't really lose any information once we apply exclusive or. Okay, so there we go and uh, we see here that RC4 is used uh, in SSL type communications. It has been in the past but uh, more common now is the EES standard but it still can be used as part of the negotiation between the server and the client to use RC4. Okay, so let's have a look at our bitstream. There we go. That's our exclusive or operator. We have our data stream. Then we have our our infinite key. And this is going to be our cipher. Okay, so here is our data stream. And with exclusive or we exclusive or each bit one at a time. So there's a one a zero and a one at the start there. That should give us a one when we look at our cipher stream. Okay, so there's our one. Then the next bit is a one and a one, which gives us zero, zero and a one, which should give us one, and so on. Okay, so it's a fairly, fairly simple operation, uh, but uh, powerful from a cryptography point of view. Okay, so how do we generate our keys? Well, often what we do is we use a key generator, we use a passphrase, and we get a concept called the key entropy. Key entropy really defines the equivalence in the key length. If we remember from the first presentation, 72 bits was about uh, as secure as we could get at the present time. So anything less than that is probably crackable. So our key entropy is the number of phrases that we might use uh, to the log to the base 10 divided by log to the base 10 of 2. And then that gives us our equivalence in our, our equivalent to an encryption key. 16 phrases, if you do the maths, then you end up with that's being equivalent to four bits uh, and, and so on. Okay, with standard English, we actually find that uh, it's equivalent to about 1.3 bits per character. So an eight character word gives us a 10.4 bits in terms of key entropy. So see that's probably fairly easy to be able to crack. Okay, so let's look at how we can add some salt to our encryption. So there's Bob again. Okay, so there's Bob and we have Alice. Okay, so there's Alice and uh, Bob sends some plain text, converts it hopefully into cipher text, and then sends it over. Okay, so if we just use the standard encryption methods that we've seen up to now of taking our block codes, then all we have us to do is to copy the cipher text and send it back. So she might not be able to crack the ciphertext, but she can replay the message back to Alice. She copies it, she doesn't have the key, she plays it back, and she can do that. So what we really need to do is to be able to add some, not crisps, but some salt to our encryption process to make sure that every single time we send something, it's actually different. Okay, so we're gonna add some salt so the standard method that we can use without salt is what's called the electronic codebook. So with the electronic codebook, uh, we encrypt each block one at a time. So when we send the message such as hello, and we send that again, it will give us the same cipher stream so that someone could actually play it back again. Okay, so that's applied to each, each block. We can add salt though, and salt will allow us a different output for different uh, data. Okay, so what we need is we need our key, and there's our key, and we also need what's called an initialization vector. Initialization vector will change the first block there. Uh, and then what we do is that we, is that we chain from one output block into the other and exclusive or and again we encrypt that one 
so that will change every single block that we actually uh, have okay so there's our initialization vector and there's our key in there so we should get a different cipher each time and this is what's called cipher block chaining and uh, this is the typical method that's used in most encryption with a private key and we can see the problem here if we take our original image and if we use uh, code electronic code book we actually see that similar blocks come out roughly the same so our penguin can actually still be seen if we use a top quality AES with the electronic code book but then if we use cipher block chaining then we see that uh, it's completely noisy as we should expect in encryption okay so let's look at a couple of uh, these types of methods so this is 3DES 3DES was based on the original DES standard and we had to make it more secure because it only used 56 bits so what we do is we use two keys one key to encrypt okay just draw that key and then the next key will then decrypt gives us 112 bits equivalent key and then the final key we'll use from the first one and then we'll use that to encrypt so 3DES has three stages to it which obviously makes it slower than more modern standards with AES we have a single stage that we go through it's more typically 128 bit blocks and we can use various key sizes for that okay so there's our key and as I've seen as long as we use above 72 bits we should be okay 128 bits 192 or 256 bit encryption is just fine so this is when we use our symmetric key or private key encryption and there was a competition held by NIST who announced in 2001 the the winning entry and it was the AES standard it took five years and it was defined as Reindal and actually comes from the name of the Belgian uh, creators uh, that's the first one and there's the second one and here they are Okay, so those two chaps created the AES standard. Okay. So now we'll look at uh, how we can pass keys between Bob and Alice. And the key part of this is the Diffie Hellman method or DH method, seen extensively within cryptography. Okay, so we have Bob back again. And then we'll have Alice. So here's Alice. And unfortunately, there's Eve in the middle. Okay. So the challenge that we have really is to be able to send our ciphertext over. And how can we send this key over to Alice so that Eve? doesn't know what the key actually is and it was answered by this person here Whitfield Diffie and he created the Diffie Hellman method okay so let's have a look at that Diffie Hellman or DH and it's really a precursor to public key encryption methods that we'll see later too okay so what he came up with was this method uh, between Bob and Alice Okay, so what he did was to create this mathematics. So Bob and Alice agree in two values, G and N. Then Bob creates a random value X, Alice creates Y, and then Bob calculates A, G to the power of X, and then takes the modulus of N. Then Alice does G to the power of Y, mod N. The value of N needs to be a prime number, possibly a very large prime number. And then Bob sends over A to Alice 
and Alice sends over B to Bob. Even though Eve is listening, you shouldn't be able to crack or generate the same code as Bob and Alice. At the end of it, Bob makes that calculation and Alice makes that calculation and then they should both agree at the end. So let's have a look at a practical example. There's the key exchange. Okay, so we take uh, values of 5 and 7. So n is 7, that's a prime number. Bob generates 3, uh, Alice 4, and then uh, Bob calculates 3 to the power of 5, mod 7, which would be 6, and Alice generates 5 to the power of 4, mod 7, which is 2. So 6 gets sent over, and then 2 gets sent over from Alice. They do some calculations, and in the end, they end up with the same key, which is 1. Obviously, in a real-life example, the values would be much greater than this, but this just shows a simple example. Unfortunately, uh, the Diffie-Hellman method suffers a little bit. And it suffers as many things in security from a man-in-the-middle type attack. What happens if Eve gets in between the communications as in between the key negotiation part? If she can, then what will happen is that she'll negotiate one key with Bob and another key with Alice. As far as Bob and Alice are concerned, they are just using a single key each key each but actually it's going through Eve so the Eve is, is able to negotiate two tunnels one between her and Bob and one between her and Alice okay so that's it she negotiates one key there and another key over there and as far as they're concerned they're communicating securely but actually it's going via Eve Okay, so there's a negotiation there with Alice, that should be, and there are two keys. Okay, so let's now look at public key, which really addresses uh, the problems uh, around our key exchange. Okay, so now we have Bob again. Let's draw Alice. There's Alice, and there's Eve. Okay, so the, the problem of, of Diffie-Hellman is that we need Alice to be online to be able to negotiate the key, but what happens if Alice isn't online at the time? So can we generate uh, a method which would allow us to be able to create two keys one to encrypt and then one to, de to decrypt. Then we could distribute our public key to anyone who wanted it. It's a bit like having a, a padlock that we could uh, distribute our padlocks to anybody. They would lock up the box and then we'd have we would only have the keys to be able to open the padlock. And this problem was solved by Ron Rivest, Aldi Shamir and Len Alderman in 1977 when they created the RSA algorithm for public key encryption. And it uses prime numbers and the difficulty to factorize prime numbers. So these are the guys there. Okay, so if you're interested, then this is Shamir. This is Ron Rivest. And this is Alderman. Okay, so let's look at this in some detail. So we have one key here which we define as a public key key and that is then used to encrypt our data so let's go ahead and encrypt that one to give us our cipher and then the only key which is able to then decrypt it is this private key here okay let's draw another key we'll call that a private key and it's only this special key that is able to then decrypt the cipher to give us our message back again. And there it is. Okay, so how do we generate these these special keys, the two keys that sit together? So the first thing we do is we pick a couple of big prime numbers and we'll just pick some very simple ones, P is 11 and Q is 3. We then multiply these together to give us N, that's 33 in this case. 
then what we do is we calculate phi which is uh, p minus 1 times q minus 1 so that's 10 times 2 which is 20 and then the next thing that we do is that uh, we've got to be able to so there's there's certain factors um, of phi and we pick a public exponent which is generated so that the 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 highest common divisor between e this value that we're going to pick and phi is one so we shouldn't be able to find a factor in either e or phi apart from one okay so what we'll do is we'll pick a value of e pick the smallest one so it's not one it's not two because two is also a phi so three three would three would work quite well uh, seven might be a possibility uh, but we'll, we'll select three we then calculate a public key which is n and e and that's 33 and e and then there's a little bit of calculation here to be able to, to uh, create our decrypt key and then we end up with our private key of 33 and 7 now if you're interested we have some online examples uh, for this but there's the calculation that we make for the cipher text using our encryption key and then that's what we use for our decryption and there okay so if you look at a security site you should be able to find some examples of some simple ones to be able to show that okay so let's look at a, a, an example okay RSA typically 1024 but we're now going up to 2048 bits for our key size okay so let, there's Bob and here's Alice and what we'll do is we'll just give each of the keys a different color just so you can actually see them okay so Bob has a public key and we'll make that one green okay there's Bob's key and we'll get our green pen to identify it and let's create Bob's private key we'll see this is a really important key we'll see later that this is the key that Bob used to identify himself but in this case we're just looking at keeping the message secret but Bob's private key will come back uh, in the next presentation to show how we can identify Bob but for just now we'll just keep our message secret so we'll make Alice's public key red and there's her private key let's draw it there and we'll make her private key blue okay we find the blue pen and that's her private key now what we're going to do is we're going to send Alice um, uh, some a message. So we take Alice's public key. We'll see in the next presentation how that actually happens. But let let's assume that uh, Bob has managed to get Alice's public key. So then we'll use that public key to then create the cipher. And once it's created, not even Bob can actually crack that cipher anymore. So it's too late. He's already done the cipher. So the only key that can now decrypt that is Alice's private key Alice applies is that applies that and she'll get back the plain text again so that shows how the uh, public key is actually used to be able to keep things nice and secret the next type of cryptography that we have is a one-way hash so typical ones here NT hash MD4 MD5 SHA1 SHA256 SHA5112 We'll look at this in more detail in the next presentation, but we'll, we'll look at some of the very basics of this. So what happens is that we take some data, in this case some text, and then we create a special hash function from it. We shouldn't be able to reverse that back. They'd be able to find out what the original uh, data actually was. So mathematically, it's not possible. So we use this to create digital fingerprints. Uh, we'll see that we use it uh, to be able to identify and verify things in the next presentation and also to store passwords in a, in a secure way okay so we might have a message hello 
So hello then gets converted, and this is uh, our hashing algorithm. And if we use MD5, then the MD5 hexadecimal uh, fingerprint for hello is that. Okay, so what we'll find is that the same length of hash signature always applies no matter how much data that we actually apply to it. We'll see that in the next presentation. So Eve shouldn't be able to look at the value and then reverse it back into the, the data. Okay, we see extensively, uh, this is an example of a Cisco router. So there we go, we see at the very bottom, enable secret, there's a hash uh, signature there for the password on the device. And we see also in Linux passwords, if you look at a password file or a shadow file, that's what it looks like. Unfortunately, uh, it's fairly easy for Eve to be able to crack this. All that Eve does is that she builds up a table of common words and then works out the hash. And what she'll do is then identify the one that matches the hash. So in this case, she's found it. There, my pass. And this is an example of what's called a rainbow table, where we can have pre-prepared lists of these hash values and then we can just look to find the the hash value and then from the hash value we can actually determine what the original uh, value actually was. Okay, so the, the, the other things that we have, we can also have a, what's called a collision uh, with inside hash values. Obviously there is a finite space for our hash values and it might be possible that the same hash uh, signature uh, results from, from different, uh, different data. And even worse, we can also get a similar con context where the messages could have been similar with inside that context and then even a full context where two different messages that might say something different actually produce the same hash signature. MD5 has been shown to be fairly weak in terms of collisions and that it doesn't take too long for data to produce uh, a different, as the same hash value. So what we typically do is we add a bit of salt and what we do is to be able to have the same, uh, the same data producing different hash values. So we can see this with inside our passwords that we produce. Okay, so this is we add salt to our hash values. Okay, and this is with OpenSSL. We say generate a password for us. Minus one means MD5. And then we add a salt. So in this case, we're adding the salt of Fred. And we're going to create that for password. Okay, so we've got password, Fred is our salt, and then that's the value that we have there that results. And when, anal when we analyze that, this is what we get in our password file. We see the dollars. Between the dollars, we get one, which means MD5. We then get the salt value, in this case, Fred, and then we see the hash value. So when someone logs into the system, you will take their password, you then take the salt, apply OpenSSL, and then check what the hash value is. If it's the same as the one that's held in the password file, then the, the password is actually correct. So in this way, we can actually protect our passwords. Okay, so this has given us a basic introduction to public key encryption, also hashing. In the next presentation, we'll look in more detail at the full process of how we identify and keep things secret.